Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting right into it. Okay, sorry. The most specialist of guests today. The director of Son of the Mask. Hey, buddy. Larry Guterman. So tell, tell them, take the backstory of what you did and what you found. And then I'll tell you my reaction. Okay, so... Uh you saw all these videos on Son of the Mask. Right. We had a cut. And Sorry. you emailed me. That's right. So you want me to talk about what I saw? or how I, I want you them? to talk about, so you were cleaning out your house. Yeah, we were, right. We were doing some cleanup and putting away stuff, throwing stuff out that was in storage. And I came across this box like a time capsule from whatever it was, 2005, with tapes, with a cut of the movie that never got seen uh, that was moving towards being a screened cut but never got seen. So we had this cut of the movie that was um, the PG-13 version. But that's not the movie that was released. It was released as a PG movie, so we had to kind of strip out a lot of stuff. And I come across this cut of the movie that never got screened that had this sort of whole other layer to it that was kind of PG-13 humor like the original. Let me talk, but I want you to talk. So you see it, and then you email me. That's right. I so you. He, he says it's so much better off camera. He's freaked out. Larry was cleaning out his house with his wife. He found an old tape with his cut of Son of the Mask. You know the Schneider cut? You know the David Ayer cut? The Guterman cut. It says it on the tape. He found it in the box, in the attic, like the movie. He emails me. He says, dude, you got to watch this. You come over to my house today. You bring a VCR <laughs> with a huge monitor. And I just sat up there and watched it with you. And I wanted to talk to you right on camera, my reactions. And then I want you to tell me everything you feel. Dude. First of all, I never saw that cut, did I? No. Oh, my God. That cut with the release date that we were promised, with the marketing that we were promised, July 4th of 2004. That cut would have been a very different outcome. There's so much in that movie I don't remember seeing. And then I remember doing it. So much like improv, so much on the fly, so much little jokes. Do you know what your cut has? It has layers. It has fun. It has a slow burn. It has a depth it has pathos it has adventure like early marvel cinematic universe adventure it has homage to tex avery it has cartoon 
with CGI melding beautiful. It has beginning, middle, and end. It has story that totally wraps itself up. It has world building. It has pre-Thor, pre-Loki, before Marvel. It has complete setup for sequel Z. It has, I see Jim Carrey coming back. I see the dog, how that unleashed another world. It had real life cartoons, Coyote and Roadrunner, but a believable in a way that we never saw through CGI, that you're looking at like a, almost a live action cartoon mix hybrid. It has the simplest th- th- plot line, but with a lot of beautiful things to hang off of it. And, and just like what the movie was supposed to be. What happens if you're a young couple and you're a guy who kind of has this arrested development, who's kind of like a man child, who has a woman who's a little bit more mature than him, who wants to start a family. And then they accidentally get pregnant. And then you find out that the baby is basically Superman. <sighs> Dude, I am, I am, I am like, I'm going through a lot of emotions right now. Uh-huh. But I am blown away. Yeah, I think you hit. I think you hit the nail on the head on a lot of points. As as a quick reaction, that was my feeling when I saw it too. And you know, at the time, that cut was only shown to one person. It was shown to the daughter of the of the director of photography. Just kind of like we were working our way through things, and you know, you don't have any distance when you're doing it. You know, and she watched it, and she's like, "Oh yeah, that." Yeah, I really like that. That was kind of like the gut level reaction. And then, of course, you get notes and you get all kinds of, and then, you know, the, the rating change. And so we had to strip out and untie that thing. You talk about layers, you know. I mean, the, the point is what you want is counter, counterpoint in a movie like this. Tone is so important. It's critical to get the tone right. You know, look at a movie like Guardians of the Galaxy, which is, what year did that come out? 2015, 2016 or something? 14. Like 10, 2014. Almost 10 years later. Nine years later. Think about that movie for a second. Imagine that that movie had been released as a PG movie and they took out anything related to the music or the, the counterpoint. What's that movie? It's a talking tree and it's a, talk, it's a gun shooting raccoon, right? It could have been a kid's movie. They could have said, let's release it as a family film, as a kid's movie. Would it have done well? I don't think so. The whole point of that movie was the counterpoint of a talking tree and wry humor and deadpan reactions and great, great one-liners and, you know, great, great nostalgic music. You know, all that stuff worked for adults. So it worked for adults and kids. I remember seeing something like uh, Al Pacino's reaction. Al Pacino is, you know, grand, grand, grand man of, of cinema loving that movie, saying it was a hoot. You know, so it just worked for every age group, every level. And that was sort of the ambition of this movie. And the, and the, the albatross around the neck of this movie is that back then when it was released, the original mask was still in the minds of the, of the, of the people who were going to see it who were adults maybe, or who were, you know, young adults. But and when the movie was released as a PG movie, and the original mask was PG thirteen, and when you know people had this expectation that it would have Jim Carrey and it didn't have him, you had these unbelievable shoes to fill, and we said let's make it totally different. Let's use the the conceit of a mask that can turn people into you know that has these powers, but let's make a completely separate film so that it isn't compared to the first film because it wasn't Jim Carrey it was its own film it was his father son story it was a father's conflict between work and family classic classic conflict and um, you know you could do that 
So the problem was you had, you, you had, you were saddled with this idea that you were doing a sequel to the mask and they were going to market it in that way. But on the other hand, it's a standalone film now, and by the way, the ratings on this film on Amazon right now are 4.3 out of five and 3000 ratings or something like that. So subsequent generations and younger kids did end up liking it. They caught it on DVD. They caught it on cable. They caught it on streaming. Um, and it's success, it was successful in that. It, the first wave was a lot of people who maybe felt like, well, it wasn't Jim Carrey and it wasn't connected to the first movie. So there was sort of a, but, but there was sort of a, a resistance to that, but that could have been overcome. But when the rating was changed to PG, it stripped out an entire layer, layer of comedy that was the counterpoint to the visceral cinematic style of the movie, the sort of heavy handed style. And you're right, it's an homage. It's not just Tex Avery, it's Chuck Jones, actually. Even even more so. Chuck Jones. Kind of, the first movie was a Tim Avery homage. A Tex Avery homage. It was uh, cartoons, uh, shorts of the 30s and 40s. And the second film was a bit more of a Chuck Jones homage, the 50s, mm -hmm. which was One Froggy Evening, which Spielberg calls the Citizen Kane of animated shorts, right? So that premise that... that in the cartoon, it's the singing frog who only sings when the guy's looking and when he tries to show it to other people to make money, it just sits there and ribbits was a similar premise to the baby driving you slowly, like you said, a slow burn, slowly driving you insane. And I really felt that in this cut. In this cut, what I feel like watching it, it feels like, oh, this character is slowly being driven insane and it's logical cause and effect step by step by step and it escalates and escalates and escalates to the point where... It's so insane that it's hysterically funny. Um, you know, that, that all played. And if you discount, the, if you just ignore the fact that there was a first movie and you watch this movie alone, it plays. You know? So, but I'm glad to hear your reaction. I'm, you know, I watch it and I just thought, oh, this is really good. <laughs> like, instead of thinking, oh, when it came out, it was marketed to little kids, but it was too aggressive. The cinematic style was too aggressive for kids. So what adult is going to take their kid to see it? And so there was no audience because it also had the layer of adult humor, the PG-13 stuff, stripped out as well. So parents couldn't enjoy it. And for kids, it was like a little too dark and aggressive on the big screen. Now what you have is the combination that feels like it works. And it's like a switch that flips. I mean, you can look at a movie like Dumb and Dumber. Mm -hmm. I maintain this is definitely the case. And without the scene where Jim Carrey kind of starts to almost tear up and says, I just, I just want someone to love, totally earnestly, no overplaying it. Without that moment in the movie, the entire movie doesn't work. You don't have that moment where you empathize with him when he's talking to Jeff Daniels in the apartment at the beginning. I just want someone to love. There's no movie. Right. So think about the th thousands of decisions that are made in piecing together a story and a movie and the layers of nuance that you need to get someone through and tonally to make it work and to make it balance correctly. There's thousands of those decisions in a cut. And that's the difference between the Snyder, the original cut that went out of the Justice League and the Snyder cut. I watched one of those sequences. I watched the bank robbery scene where Gal Gadot comes in Wonder Woman and stops the bank robber. And there was a side-by-side -side on the internet. Someone put up a YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. They showed the cut that was in the theaters whenever it was 2017. And then they showed the cut that, you know, streaming 2021. And also in the theaters. Side-by-side. -side. No comparison. One was clearly better than the other. I mean, not just better. One was good and the other one wasn't. Right? And the reason was is the attention to the detail... And the, the, and the nuance in the revised cut, the one that, that uh, Snyder, Snyder preferred, that sold it, sold the moment. And you just build those moments, moment to moment, at moment. And when you sell them, they work. And, you know, the politics of a studio, whatever it is, whatever the reason is, whether they decided, oh, my God, they got maybe cold feet. They're like, we got to release this as a kid's film, as a PG film. You know, we've got to market it as a, as a purely kid's film. That, that didn't play, unfortunately. But this cut 
works. And as an adult, you can watch it and be entertained. You just tell me, tell me, were you ever bored watching this tonight? No. No. And were you, did, did it sag at all? No. No. And was it funny throughout pretty much? Yes. Yes. And was, if, where it wasn't funny, was there something visually stimulating? Yes. And where, when there wasn't something visually stimulating, was it emotional? Yes. Yes. And did you follow this guy's story, his conflict clearly between having to take care of a kid and, and yearning to succeed at work and having some ambition and being able to succeed? You got that. You felt that conflict. Yes. You know? And then the resolution... By the way, I don't think this is in the actual film, but in the resolution, they show them putting together all the elements from the story that happened over the course of the movie into the show. Making, the making of it. I think the making of it is missing from the film. It's, it's the motion capture sequence, if you remember at the end, where he's standing there with his boss, and the boss says, this has got that, and you, you fill in the line, spark. So like you said, there's a unity, there's setups and payoffs. There's a feeling that everything comes full circle. When when I I watch it, I'm <laughs> I'm I have to take it in. First of all, the performances are amazing. Alan Cumming is amazing. You yeah. know, trailer is amazing. Yeah, Bob, Bob Hoskins. Yeah, Bob is just amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, but, but Stephen Wright. Yeah. You know, those just those different Australian actors. Yeah. Stephen Wright, when he says, uh, if we knew where the great ones came, you say, my dog, where, where'd you get this idea for this, you know, crazy <laughs> character? And you go, my, my dog, whatever the line is. And he says, uh, if we knew where the great ones came from, we'd go there every day, right? <laughs> yes. He's got this deadpan look on his, I mean, Stephen Wright, amazing stand-up. Amazing. And Cal Penn, Earl, you know. Oh. So funny, but Jerry Minor in the scene in the, in the in the antique shop, right? So good, yeah. And I'm looking at it. I'm just like, <sighs> the, the marketing was it's a baby versus a dog. The movie is Tim's conflict, slowly being driven insane by the clash between the baby and the dog, which is the metaphor for sibling rivalry. It's called, this show is called sibling rivalry at the end where the one sibling is the baby and one sibling is the dog. The dog is jealous. What would happen if you could anthrop anthropomorphize the feelings of a dog when a baby comes into the house? The dog is jealous. How do you anthropomorphize that and externalize that? You give him the mask and you watch him go crazy, right? There's a, there's a good premise there. There's so many. It, it, first of all, it touched me and I'm going to say what I say and I've, what I can gather out of it. For me, the, one of the first things that drew me to the movie was the Mr. Mom element. Mr. Mom is one of my favorite movies of all time. Early Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Which basically is when the dad becomes the stay-at-home mom. Right. Which you can't say that in 2021. But there was a time <laughs> where it was more common for women to stay at home. And he has to do all those things. So it was like this guy, his wife is the breadwinner. He's the struggling artist. He's got all these great ideas. She's the wind beneath his wings, which, you know, is a beautiful message, right? You want your partner to be, you know, to believe in you. And then they have this baby. He's reluctant to it, just like you said. Then slowly he starts noticing things. That's weird. What is that? The simplest thing of changing a diaper. That's bizarre. Wait, hold on. When he, the light bulb thing. That's so funny. It's so cute, right? When you say it's funny, it is. There's moments where I laugh out loud. There's other moments where it's just cute. It's cute funny. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, it, 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 it's not like a George Carlin funny, but it's really funny for what it, it, the genre we're hitting. It's cute. It's entertaining as hell. And... I'm sitting there and, and then, and then slowly my character, and I want to see if you agree with this, starts turning into Jack Torrance. He what? Sorry. Starts turning into Jack Torrance from The Shining. Oh. <laughs> He's going that crazy. Right. And, and, and we knew, we knew we we're not going to go that far, but it's like what in God's green. And then 
The dog getting it makes complete sense. Right. And it's like, what the hell? That it, it's so, so true. Animals and do do that. They are loyal with the owner and they do get, you know, they have been like, there's jealousy there. I've seen cases of that and yeah. new babies get jealous of things and whatever. So the sibling rivalry is real. It's this base element in our nature. Right. And it wasn't, like you said, we were not ever trying to be, what happens when a mild manner man gets the mask and then becomes his super id? That's the Jim Carrey one. Right. Ours is, what happens when a mild mannered man, uh, you know, who's, he's not bereft of ideas. He, he had ideas. He couldn't get them through, but then stumbles upon this. It was not really about him. It's about the mask enters this world right. and then becomes the family mask. Right. I get it. You know, Alan coming, even though he doesn't wear it still has those powers naturally right. Right. because he's Loki, the baby right. and the dog. And so, it becomes more of a live action cartoon homage, very live action Chuck Jones, like you said, one Friday evening, which is this, you know, is the the Citizen Kane of cartoons. Like that's just right. a fact. I used, grew up watching that, and yeah, I saw you laughed that loud during this uh, the sperm sequence. It's exactly when the Chariots of Fire music started playing, and they were going in slow motion, and they were getting like you know G forces on their faces. <laughs> 